Um, for those who don't know, uh, Richard has uh, an article out in the Journal of Strategic Studies, Air Power Review, he's got a chapter in an edited collection, and he's got a journal, uh, journal article coming out in October in the Journal of Military History. And this is a slightly new piece of research that you're you're playing with at the moment. This will, yeah. will this be a be part a, of the forthcoming, forthcoming, forthcoming book, hopefully. Okay, so. I'll see what's done, though, please. Nice. Okay, so I think most people, when they think of uh, anti-shipping operations, the campaign in the Mediterranean, they think of a campaign that's specifically related to uh, shipping between Italy and North Africa to supply access forces in North Africa, and attempts to interdict them with forces operating out of Malta, and that is certainly an extremely large part of it. But actually, one of the things I'm going to sketch out in this campaign, uh, in this paper, is really that the campaign is much wider and it it's, involves a much wider axis logistics network across the theatre. And actually it goes on beyond the uh, capitulation in Tunisia in May 43, it goes right on through to the end of, of 1944, albeit with kind of varying uh, levels of effect. So broadly, I mean, this is from the uh, British official history Mediterranean the Middle East series. Uh, this is perhaps what we think of as, as the traditional uh, anti-shipping campaign. So this idea of the blue lines, the green lines are related to um, uh, use of aircraft. But the blue lines here, as you see, this idea sending shipping down from the key um, uh, departure points in Italy, places like Naples, uh, Brindisi, sending these south, first of all, particularly to Tripoli, to my forces in Libya. Later, as um, Axis forces advance further east, they can send them to other ports further forward in Saranaica, like Benghazi, Tobruk. Uh, and then, of course, later into late 42 into 43, we have the Tunisian campaign. So yes, they, they supply into, into Tunis, into Deserta. So that's perhaps the most common conception of the campaign. Yes, that's a big part of it. But actually, uh, the actors have to sustain things like um, shipping up here to uh, sustain positions in Sardinia. And later, as they have Corsica from the French, they have to sustain uh, their forces in Corsica. There's also um, a lot of trade between Italy and, and Spain just off the map. Uh, they have to support, send huge quantities of supplies across the Adriatic uh, to ports in Albania to support, first of all, their position after they annex Albania in 39, but then particularly after the invasion of Greece, that causes a huge need for material that has to be sent across the Adriatic, it's the best way to do it. And of course, they have um, positions across the Aegean Sea as well. So the Dodecanese Islands, for instance, we have down here. Um, they, they have to be supplied, places like uh, Kosleros roads, these have to have large quantities of supplies sent to them, later they take Crete, which itself becomes a part of uh, the network to North Africa. But all of this has to um, be supplied, and this is very much wider sort of access logistics network that I'm referring to. And actually all parts of this come under some form of attack, primarily British-led, but later sort of broadly allied attack at some point from 1940 to 1944. And it's, it's not just from forces operating out of Malta, which we often perhaps um, identify with most closely. They, they operate out of Malta, yes, they also operate out of uh, Egypt, briefly out of mainland Greece, uh, out of Cyprus, out of, out of Palestine, um, out of parts of Algeria, uh, later from sort of mainland Italy itself. So it's a much, much wider campaign than, than perhaps we have a, a sort of the popular perception. It's logical to start with the war in North Africa, I think, and broadly this can be split into to two sections, one looking at the war in, in Libya and Egypt, 1940 to 42, and then as you get into sort of late 42 and into 43, you can look at the war in Tunisia, because they, they represent two very different, two very different things when it comes to the logistic aspects. Um, and the historiography related to this, it has, this is where the vast majority of the interest has sort of come from historians to date, it's this idea of the perception, this is where it all leads. But um, there's a broad kind of split in the, in the perceptions and this idea from the initial official histories that it, uh, and shipping operations are actually really effective in degrading uh, the access position in North Africa and vital sort of in contributing to, to British and later allied victory there. So we see here the quote, the quote from Ruskell, uh, it, it contributes greatly to the collapse in North Africa. This is an initial initial view, and it, it garners much support and has had much support since. People like uh, Ralph Bennett, for instance, other official histories, they, they, they kind of toe this line. Um, 
Elsewhere, though, the other people are more critical. The Italian official history, that's there in the middle, uh, comes forward with this idea that actually, if you look in terms of, of what's sent across the Med, everything they send roughly equates to the sort of total capacity of the different ports in the first place. Therefore, how can uh, the anti shipping campaign possibly have had any effect at all? And the most critical, Martin Van Creveld, in his, in his book Supplying War, uh, with a sort of a a vague concession either in November, December 41, around the time of Operation Crusader, there is some effect. He generally says that ultimately the aeronaval struggle in the Mediterranean is, is just irrelevant. What, what matters in terms of access logistics are these very long overland supply routes and the sort of not having the necessary port capacity. There are others that have fallen with slightly more sort of nuanced views within this. So for the, the, the German histories, for instance, uh, Das Deutsche Reich, uh, they point to this idea of, of, a, of a sort of more nuanced view where it's the anti-shipping campaign manages to kind of uh, cause important operational shortages, but ultimately sort of falling on this idea of Van Creveld. Um, I'd argue that, that, that generally the, the reality falls somewhere between these kind of views, but are often for reasons that they haven't necessarily fully considered. Uh, things like the overall attrition to, to access shipping is, is, is highly important. So in 1940, the early, the early sort of point of the campaign, it really does not have any effect because ultimately uh, the British are unprepared really in the Mediterranean. They have very few forces there. They're just, you know, in, in terms of an ability to sort of make any, any impact. They have sort of a handful of submarines, you know, a few, a few aircraft and a sort of widely uh, overstretched Royal Navy Mediterranean fleet uh, and a widely overstretched RAF Middle East. There's not really anything other than sort of occasional opportunistic attacks to make a, any inroad into this logistics network. Uh, over the course of, of 1940 into early 41, they only actually sink around 2% of the supplies that are sent to North Africa. So the initial... Um, British offensive in, in late 40 into early 1941, Operation Compass, achieves great success without any impact really from this uh, anti-shipping operations. They're, they're able to do it without any sort of relevance from that. Uh, but the reason here is really because the, the Italian forces that, that they come up against are sort of completely under mobilized. They're not designed to operate in a, in a desert environment despite having been there for some time. Uh, they, they they just don't have enough vehicles, they don't have the right equipment, they're poorly led, and this is what leads to sort of the, the infamous kind of collapse of the Italian 10th Army and, and vast numbers of, of people surrendering to the British just because they're not equipped to actually operate in the desert. So they're able to gain supply, um, able to gain successes, the British, without actually having any impact into the supply situation. Uh, by spring 1941, things do start to change a bit. More forces are sent to the Med, more specialised forces as well are sent to sort of take a greater part in the anti-shipping campaign. Uh, and they're used in a, a slightly more joint fashion as well. There's, there's more joined up thinking within their use. Um, particularly if you, you go look to my article in the Journal of Strategic Studies, sort of it, it sketches out this idea of, of becoming more sort of combined as the campaign goes on. Uh, so new and better surface forces, uh, new and better submarines, more relevant aircraft are sent. They have some notable successes. Um, surface forces operating for Malta sink a whole convoy for the first time, for instance, in, in April 41. Uh, the capacity of Tripoli is reduced by 50% in May. They, don't, they do have some successes, um, but although tangible effects are occurring to some extent, the, the sustained sinkings aren't enough to actually sort of do that much to affect the access in North Africa at this stage still. Where they do make some inroads uh, is into coastal shipping between Tripoli and Benghazi, um, which is vitally important in terms of sort of uh, getting around this Van Creveld idea of difficult overland supply routes. So they send supplies up the coast with small shipping, but the, the British are able to sort of uh, get into that quite effectively uh, and erode that quite, quite well. So ultimately, they are having at least some effect on the coastal aspect, uh, which has greatly increased over the course of 1941. The Italian Navy as well is forced to then operate in ways in which it's, it's not used to operating in, in sort of uh, coastal escort roles. Uh, they're being forced to, to kind of concentrate here and it's something where they suffer sort of attrition of a few 
relevant forces very early on. Uh, it causes the Deutsche Afrika Corps to kind of complain in um, <clears throat> to complain in May. The situation is very poor, and they specifically point to the extremely successful uh, British interdiction attempts across the coastal routes between Tripoli and Benghazi. Uh, and Rommel repeatedly requests further coastal shipping to be sent, but this coastal shipping often then receives further attrition. So it's it's a, a constant kind of cyclical effect. It's also an important indication of the sort of necessary nature of the forward ports for the Axis of so Benghazi later to a lesser extent to Tobruk because they cut out such a large uh, proportion of the overland supply routes. So Benghazi is around 700 miles east of Tripoli, Tobruk a further 300 miles east of that. So the further east the Axis are advancing, the more important these ports become and therefore the more British can do to, to sort of stop those routes in particular is, is highly important. And by July, the uh, Deutsche Afrika Corps is, is recommending that Benghazi needs to become the primary support, primary port for supplies to land at. For the British, Benghazi becomes a, a greater focal camp point of the campaign in North Africa. By the summer of 1941, the RAF conducts over a thousand raids against Benghazi between uh, June and October, for instance. Uh, in November 1941, New British uh, offensive to retake Cyrenaica, known as Operation Crusader, takes place. Uh, and the heavy sinkings in November and December really very much impact the Axis' ability to defend against this. And this is where even Van Creveld offers this sort of um, highly kind of vague sort of concession that there is, there is some effect from the anti-shipping campaign around this time. The months also see much greater jointery within sort of aeronaval action. You see all, all aspects uh, are involved here. Primarily submarines taking the, the biggest role, but submarines and aircraft in particular working together, new sort of technological developments to make them work together more effectively as well. Um, so the, the losses to shipping in November and December are certainly very high, but they actually are preceded by, um, in some cases, even higher attrition in the, in the previous months overall, some very high attrition in this point to uh, the Axis shipping some capabilities. By the end of the year, uh, Benghazi is reduced to being uh, able to unload only 300 tonnes a day. Uh, they, the uh, supplies they managed to stockpile around in Cyrenaica are significantly less than they're managing to get to Tripoli. Uh, in terms of the, the cubic metres of fuel, for instance, uh, 700 cubic metres of fuel, 5,765 5, tonnes of ammunition have been stockpiled uh, at the start of Crusader on the 18th of November, as opposed to much more fuel and over 20,000 tonnes of ammunition at Tripoli. So, so significant attrition on the, on the Benghazi route. In October, Rommel claims they're only actually receiving a third of the men and the seventh of the necessary supplies to go on <laughs> uh, with their own offensive, uh, and they have to move to a defensive front, but then also they don't have the supplies necessary to sort of resist the uh, British-led offensive very well. So it's, it's this attrition in general is having an important effect in, in sort of uh, setting a foundation where they logistically can't simply sort of stand up to the, the British offensive. So if we, we look at what's actually getting delivered, the first table here gives a breakdown of the different cargoes that are, that are coming through in, in November and December, sort of the key months. Uh, and I've highlighted in particular fuel and ammunition because these are, are the most important aspects of them. They generally have enough rations, but fuel in particular, absolutely a lifeblood in the desert. You cannot operate without having enough fuel. Uh, and losses here are particularly high, and they're able to some extent as well to focus on on fuel the British through use of sort of all source intelligence signals, intelligence, some human intelligence, uh, relevant use of aerial reconnaissance, things like this. Um, as you see, from November, for instance, ninety two percent of the fuel that's sent is not getting across, so it's it's not there. It's not what they need. Um, in terms of what they actually require, in terms of supplies. Estimates from this period vary sort of quite greatly uh, in terms of monthly monthly supplies that are required, sort of roughly from a, a lower end of seventy thousand tons a month to a higher end of one hundred and twenty thousand. And while this is is generally met from June to October, as you see, it's not being met at all in November and December. 
November they try and, and ship within that amount that's required, so nearly 80,000 tonnes, but in reality less than 30,000 is getting through huge uh, levels of sinkings around that time. And in December as well, there's not enough going, there's not enough going in the first place, and a part of that is down to the fact that so much shipping is, is simply unavailable at this point. No new fuel at all actually arrives uh, for the Axis from the start of Crusader through to the end of the first period of the of the British offensive, uh, and the strangulation of aviation fuel is particularly high. Van Creveld has this idea that in November, December, you can maybe draw some link between the anti-shipping campaign and what's happening on the ground. But even then, he points to this idea there's, there's still significant supplies stockpiled in Tripoli. The problem is the overland route. Well, the reason I've highlighted Axis aviation fuel is that there's not supplies stockpiled at Tripoli. In fact, what there is is getting used up very quickly, particularly the two different types of fuel be for the most important because they use that for, for nearly all types of aircraft. Um, you know, as, as we get further down into November, the further we go on, there's, there's nothing at all in, in Tripoli. What there is has been used, used up either in the, in the journey to Cyrenaica, but particularly has been sent already to Cyrenaica and it's then being used up there and it's not coming through. They're not getting enough aviation fuel through. Um, the way you can link this, in, for instance, to the, uh, the anti-shipping campaign directly is the idea that the Luftwaffe supply staffs, they set out a need for a minimum of 4,000 tonnes of aviation fuel in Cyrenaica at this period to be able to operate. What we have is virtually that total overall in North Africa uh, in October through to just you know, less than 10% of what's required as we get into December. There's not the, the aviation fuel there, but they're definitely trying to send it. I mean, if you look at uh, two ships that are sunk on the route to Benghazi in November, for instance, Procida and the Maritza, between them they're carrying uh, over 1,700 tonnes of aviation fuel. So it's clearly directly related to um, the anti shipping campaign. It's not coming through what they require. Um, so the Germans uh, had very much been expecting a British offensive uh, and they'd sort of had to issue these orders uh, that they have to take a very sort of defensive stance with limited manoeuvre due to lack of fuel. Um, there's insufficient fuel to do anything else and actually the Italian uh, area division runs out almost entirely in this period. Uh, urgent requests for fuel and ammunition were repeatedly made over this period. Uh, before the withdrawal is then made because of lack of logistics sort of supply. Van Creveld's claim that November, December is the closest the anti-shipping campaign comes to actually having an effect. Well, he's right in that it does have an effect here, but he's, he places these riders on it that are perhaps not really very realistic. Actually, it's, it's quite clearly linked and there's demonstrable, um, demonstrable evidence that it's there. I mean, we have clear sort of, in terms of the aviation fuel, Evidently, the, the German Air Force is, is talking about having, you know, lack of aviation fuel necessary to actually operate. Um, and they, they point to sort of the overarching ability, kind of control of the air from the Western Desert Air Force as being a, a major problem for them. So by uh, late December, the supply crisis starts to lift, though, for several reasons. There's uh, a storm, for instance, which were very much hampers kind of uh, and shipping operations. Uh, the Italians managed to have success uh, against the uh, Royal Navy in Alexandria through sort of special use of uh, clever use of kind of special forces, sink two battleships there. Um, surface forces operating from Malta run into a minefield and have effectively neutralised. Um, and they start to sort of have slightly better sort of convoy operations put in place and a better way, sort of better methods for uh, escort put in place over this period. And all these come together to start to really sort of bring down sinkings that are made as we get into 1942 and they really peter out from January 42 onwards, these sinkings. Um, the British themselves, they have their own logistic problems. They sort of grind to a halt in early January around uh, El Ahila, just on kind of the western end of Cyrenaica. Uh, and Crusader kind of peters to an end in that respect. While they're unable to sort of sufficiently reinforce their own position, the Axis now are able to get the supplies across that they need, and they're able to get themselves in a position where they can build up the necessary supply base to make their own offensive. Um, 
things like uh, heavy bombing of Malta, use of use of U-boats to uh, sort of restrict the Royal Navy, things like that. All these are working together to let more supplies come across, and they have this basis for a new Axis offensive. Uh, for their part, the British are forced to focus on, on the defensive very much in 1942, and they have to do things like focus on supplying Malta instead. So the very little is coming through uh, in the way of, of kind of reinforcements to continue with the anti-shipping campaign. Um, what forces are coming in are focused on things like uh, defending convoys to Malta. This, is, this becomes the primary sort of uh, priority in this period, and actually the War Cabinet refers to it as the Battle for Malta. Uh, sinking steadily dropped from January to July, and the Axis are regularly getting through, you know, over 90% of the stuff that is sent is actually being landed, it's arriving, it's working out. Uh, and actually in April, 150,000 tonnes of supplies are landed in North Africa as a whole. So if you go back to this idea of the um, Italian official history saying if you look at what's sent, it adds up to the sort of total capacities for the ports for the period anyway, therefore how can the campaign have had an effect? In April, as, as one example, they greatly outstrip the actual uh, supposed capacities of the ports. When there's not anything sort of happening, they're able to operate freely, they're actually bringing across more than they think they're able to and unloading far more than they're officially able to. So you need to go deeper into the figures a lot of the time for this stuff, which I think hasn't been done. Um, it's with uh, this sand supply base, really, that the, the Panzer Army is, is able to make its new offensive uh, into the Gazala line and really sort of create such a sort of momentous victory at Gazala, which was such a disaster for the, for the British and Commonwealth forces. Uh, they're able to move on and ultimately retake Tobruk, of course, and, and reach al Alamein later on. The Axis advance eastward opens up the forward ports for them, once again Benghazi and then later Tobruk, but also brings them back into the range of, of forces operating out of Egypt. Um, the siege of Malta begins to relax, submarines are returned there in July. Um, they manage to get more sort of fuel through, first of all, to, to Egypt and uh, to, to Malta for these forces to operate against the Axis. Uh, and they have better, longer range anti shipping aircraft, for instance, operating out of Malta direct, uh, operating out of Egypt directly. Uh, lots of things like new American aircraft coming through, uh, new sort of kind of uh, tactical operating procedures are, are developed and put in place. Use of intelligence uh, of all sources allows a greater focus on, on tankers, and they're able to focus very heavily on, on attacking the fuel supplies for the Axis. Um, effects on the Axis offensive are, are really clear as they grind to a halt around Alam Halfa. Uh, defensive action from the British does certainly hold up the attack. It's part of a, a greater whole. There's you know, very robust resistance from the, from the British around Alam Halfa. But not having the supplies and necessary fuel to operate at the greatest uh, potential really is degrading the Axis offensive. Um, as you can see here from some of the some of the bullet points, so ultimately Kettering has to order that aircraft at the front are limited in their operations due to lack of aviation fuel. Uh, Rommel is claiming the need for around 10,000 tons of uh, 10,000 cubic meters of fuel to be delivered at Benghazi and Tobruk, but really over only around a third of that is actually arriving. Um, supposedly. One of the uh, reports from the Panzer Army says that our troops are, are screaming for fuel and they have to go over to the defensive. They point directly to this lack of supplies. Uh, they're only receiving, I think it's 54% of their required supplies in September. And the German naval war staff is pointing to these, what they call these daily sinkings, really sort of hampering their ability to operate. Uh, on the <clears throat> Uh, so it's in these circumstances that the 8th Army is able to, to launch such a successful offensive around El Alamein. By mid-November, uh, Panzer Army's warning that fuel supplies were virtually exhausted and Rommel actually complains that he's not sure they'll even be able to make an effective withdrawal. British victory at El Alamein could be sort of prescribed to a wide variety of factors. They've got better leadership as opposed to Gazala. Monty is much more effective than Ritchie, certainly, for instance. Uh, they have better intelligence in place, they're much quicker at, at, at decrypting signals, for instance, much better at utilising um, the intelligence that they manage to gain. They've got better equipment in place by this stage as well. 
they've, they've sort of built up effective operational learning. There's a good sort of airland integration in place. And obviously, of course, we've had the recent work on factors like morale being highly important. But the logistics is absolutely one major part of it. And the anti-shipping campaign is important in, in really hampering this ability to operate for the axis. There's been major criticism at um, various levels of the importance of the anti-shipping campaign at this period. And the two interlinked camp sort of ideas I want to look for are this, this one from Van Crevel, that ultimately it's the lack of motor transport that's the problem. Lack of motor transport and long overland supply distance is, is the problem. And a separate idea from James Sadkovich that actually if you look at what's being sunk and where it's being sunk, it's not what's going to Benghazi, the sinkings are still to Tripoli and therefore that links into this idea of is the long overland supply route that matters. Well, firstly, the, the MT, the, the idea of uh, motor transport coming through, they are, of course, coming by sea as well. You have to get your motor transport to North Africa across the sea. And as you see, you know, generally around between a quarter and a half of what's being sent in terms of this stuff is not getting through in the first place. So no wonder they've got such problems with uh, the overland supply route because they're having to rely on captured sort of British trucks most of the time, which they don't have the spares for and they can't keep operating. They can't keep using their own stuff because not enough of it's getting through and it breaks down very quickly in the desert. And in terms of uh, Sadkovich's idea that the sinkings aren't really coming from the Bengal route, a problem is he's not using uh, sort of the source material quite correctly and he's looking at stuff that's only um, Italian registered shipping but actually a lot of what they've used is stuff they've seized elsewhere at this stage and it also doesn't incorporate stuff under a certain size so actually it's this from uh, the air files at Kew so this is just October 42 the sinkings are, are pretty much all coming around Benghazi and actually there's very little further west uh, it should be noted, sinkings on uh, route to these forward ports actually also have an important deterrent effect because regularly as they send convoys to sea, they get down to the, sort of the central Mediterranean. If they come down, they would normally split around here and go to either Benghazi or, or to Brookord or down further west. They're often rerouted en route as well because the, the sinkings on the Benghazi route are so high, they get sent further west instead. So it's having this deterrent effect as well. So if that's the, the war in, in Libya and Egypt, in terms of Tunisia, uh, you can deal with this quite a, quite a bit more succinctly than, than the former. Um, there's, there's much less of a, an argument against the effect of the campaign in Tunisia because the, the overland supply routes are, are, are very short indeed and there are better railways in place in Tunisia for the access as well. So that, that argument doesn't really stand up and it's not really applied to Tunisia. Um, the Axis front line is, is not really ever more than about 200 miles from, from a key port, Tunis, Bizerta, things like that, for the, for the majority of the campaign. The overland supply route is not significant. Uh, so this table fleshes out the sinkings, numbers and tonnage from, from January to April, and they're, they're particularly high at this stage, uh, so high that actually the, the Italian Navy, sailors from the Italian Navy working on convoy escort at this period refer to it as La Rota della Morte, the route of death because it's, it's such a dangerous place to be. Um, 305 vessels of, of nearly half a million tonnes are sunk over these four months, um, and another 120-odd thousand are sunk in May, but some of that's actually after the capitulation in Tunisia. So the sinkings are huge, uh, and with the, the aerial siege of Malta fully lifted by this stage, uh, an ability for the Royal Navy to operate more freely, and they effectively have uh, the situation surrounded, whether it's out operating further east out of Egypt, whether it's operating out of Malta, whether it's operating out of Algeria, and now they've, they've landed in northwest Africa, they're able to put a really effective blockade in place. So in terms of these numbers of things, what do they uh, translate to? Well, these are some of the complaints that come through in terms of, in terms of lack of supplies. Uh, this idea of uh, shortage of ammunition, uh, causing grave concern, they're down to only enough ammunition to sort of operate in a very limited capacity. They barely have enough fuel to move. Certain stocks have run out completely. Um, they don't really have enough fuel, enough ammunition to, to offer any kind of great resistance in the later parts of the Tunisian campaign, once you get into sort of later March, into April, 
they're, they're effectively sort of operating sort of tanks as pillboxes a lot of the time, things like that. They're just not able to, to really do very much. In terms, of, in terms of what this relates to, from what's sent to what gets there, so another breakdown table, um, ammunition, fuel again, the losses are extremely high. Uh, very little of what's sent is actually getting through. <coughs> uh, in terms of, of things like fuel in particular, they're getting way below what they require. Um, requirements are set out at around 69,000 tonnes for minimum sub subsistence is what's set out by uh, Rommel and, and von Armin for sort of March time onwards. They say 69,000 tonnes as a minimum, but really we want around 150,000 tonnes for sort of full operations. Well, they, they haven't got enough shipping to, or actually at this stage the port capacity to send the higher figures anyway. But in terms of getting enough for sort of the minimum subsistence necessary, well, if it's 69,000 tonnes, they regularly try and send it, but actually they almost never meet it. So they're never getting what they need, even for minimum subsistence. So it's very much sort of degrading the accessibility to continue in the conflict. And actually, if you look at Tunisia, you could say certainly, well, the, the, the outcome of the war in North Africa is already decided. They're surrounded, you know, we have, we have forces on both sides now. Uh, they don't have the ability to resist effectively. But you can certainly, I think, point to the anti-shipping campaign say this shortens the war in North Africa. Things get done much quicker simply because the accessibility to resist is so greatly sort of degraded from the, from the Allied side. And therefore, the anti-shipping campaign is having an effect and shortening the conflict. Uh, but what about this idea of a wider network, a wider network in, in terms of the sort of Axis logistics? If you look at uh, Sardinia and Corsica, another important sort of aspect that's going on here around the same time as Tunisia, of course, is the Allied shipping coming through the Western Mediterranean, first of all for Operation Torch itself, the landings in Northwest Africa, and then also to, to continue to keep those forces supplied, their own logistics, you need to keep these forces sustained. Uh, during the period of the torch landings in, in late 42, Axis aircraft from Sardinia sank over 200,000 tonnes of Allied shipping, uh, and it's clearly causing uh, major concern amongst the Allies. In March 43, Kessering talks about this importance to smash Allied seaborne supplies to North, Afri North Africa, and talking about this idea that every ship destroyed gives most effective support to the battle in Tunisia. Uh, the best sort of situated air bases for this are those in Sardinia. They sit right along the uh, Axis supply lines and therefore this is a clear opportunity to deliver on, on Kessering's promise, on, on Kessering's sort of uh, request. But due to the strangulation of imports to Sardinia, uh, thanks to a combination of and shipping operations and a lack of shipping in general, thanks to the attrition that's taken place, operations are greatly affected from 43 onwards. By the start of April, aviation fuel stocks are so low that they greatly hamper Axis air operations at all. Not only that, insufficient spares are arriving in order to keep the aircraft serviceable. They're down to sort of 50% serviceability by April, uh, and the situation continues to worsen. Uh, an appreciation on the 5th of May, for instance, points out that only one of the air bases on the island has minimum fuel supplies. Uh, required and stocks of aviation fuel are so low that at one of the air bases there's only two tons. By the time of Kessering's plea to actually devastate these Allied supply lines, the threat of Sardinian aircraft has actually virtually ceased to exist. They can't deliver on what he's asking for because they don't have the necessary supplies coming through. Just after the Axis surrender in Tunisia, uh, Grand Admiral Dernitz talks about taking advantage of this period of what he calls relative calm to build up supplies in Sicily and Sardinia and Corsica. Um, but he also appreciates that due to heavy losses, they, they might struggle to have the shipping in order to do this. Um, but he, he really points to greater efforts to supply uh, Sicily and Sardinia in particular. This proves impossible though, because they just don't have the shipping to do it. And the route into the main port, Cagliari, at the south of Sardinia, is completely open to attacks from. Malta from uh, North Africa, and uh, you know, attrition there is, is extremely heavy. 
Um, so ultimately, they have to take the decision to, first of all, reroute shipping to the sort of less useful northern port in Sardinia, but then ultimately to evacuate Sardinia itself. It's not realistic. They can't continue to keep it supplied. So instead, they, uh, man they have to sort of withdraw north from Sardinia and into Corsica, as, as General Ambrosio is pointing out, the lack of, of shipping has forced the situation into a crisis, so they have to cede Sardinia very quickly. They do manage to, to get across the evacuation to Corsica is, is barely sort of interdicted at all, though there's very little in, in way of an effort to stop that. Uh, the shortage of fuel of, on Sardinia is, is so acute that by June, these offensive operations by aircraft are, are completely curtailed and they have to be abandoned entirely. And attempts to uh, disrupt <coughs> evacuation from Sardinia uh, and into Corsica is uh, itself much harder to do anything about those very short route. They're not able to, to, to get involved, really, in that sense. Um, following the evacuation of, of, of Sardinia, it's decided that they have to withdraw from Corsica as well. There's no hope, hope trying to sort of hold a position in the, in the western basin of the Mediterranean. Um, and they are able to, to move across a much shorter and much less exposed um, sort of uh, sea line of communication back to Italy uh, as we get into October. And actually, as you see, very little is done in, in terms of interdicting uh, the evacuation from Corsica, and Hitler actually refers to the evacuation of Corsica as an exceptional achievement that can hardly have been hoped for. Efforts to disrupt supplies to Sicily and so soften it up for future invasion actually began right at the start of 1943, while the war in Tunisia is still going on. Uh, Calabria and Messina, the ferry ports on either side of the Straits of Messina, um, start to be the subject of heavy air attacks, as does the ferry system across the straits. Um, some of these uh, sinkings sort of relating to this period are actually extremely high. June, um, in June uh, 1943, nearly 50 vessels, over 80,000 tonnes are sunk. People think about the North African campaign being where it matters, but actually some of the heaviest sinkings are coming after it. Um, uh, despite the huge sinkings that are taking place, though, um, General Ambrosio, chief of the Italian Armed Forces, is able to point to a satisfactory supply situation on Sicily just four days before Operation Husky. At the time of the, of the collapse in Tunisia, there had been serious shortages on the island, and this idea that the, the use of, of aircraft is being seriously imperiled by the lack of fuel getting across. But actually, just before Husky, they're able to get large quantities of material across simply because they're now shed of the burden of supplying North Africa. Having been shed of that burden, keeping Sicily supplied and able to operate is actually easy enough, and particularly the German forces there, which are at this point sort of taking more than the lion's share of resources, are able to operate quite comfortably. At the time of Husky, the, the German forces are adequately supplied, the Italian forces perhaps less so. But in fact, supplies are coming across from the mainland so effectively that it actually causes congestion on the, on the Sicilian side. So and in fact, the campaign is not doing its job at all because the, the, it's much harder to interdict these routes. And in fact, it's congestion on the Sicilian side that's causing the problem. Attempts to disrupt the separately run German-Italian evacuations of Sicily uh, are also a complete failure. The concentration of heavy shore batteries on either side precludes sort of naval involvement, and there's very, very heavy anti-aircraft provision. It's referred to as being heavier than over the Reich operating there. So even though huge numbers of aircraft are used, around 3,000 aircraft make attacks over two weeks in August, actually they're having very little effect. And as you see, nearly everything that's attempted to be evacuated by the Germans or by the Italians gets across. There's huge quantities of men, material, and even some mules make it back to Italy. In the uh, aftermath of the Italian armistice, uh, and shipping operations instead start to sort of be ramped up elsewhere as the campaign shifts further north, partly into the Adriatic, but particularly into the Aegean, as part of the new Aegean strategy, which has been dubbed as, as the so-called shoestring strategy, because they try and do it without sort of a, British try and move into the Aegean without sort of a realistic basis for doing so and not having necessary resources. Uh, an attempt to take important Aegean islands over October 
November 1943 in the confusion after the Italian armistice are initially, initially effective and anti-shipping operations become geared up to try and sort of uh, impede and ideally prevent any Axis attempt to retake these islands such as Kos, Leros, Samos. Um, there's a, sort of a real problem with operating in the Aegean though because it's so far from the nearest air bases there's a small fighter strip on Kos but actually in the Aegean the, the nearest place is Cyprus which is right at the border of, of kind of operations uh, sort of operational range for things like uh, marauder aircraft which they're trying they, they want to use to interdict shipping um, as they've kept roads though and also have bases across sort of mainland Greece the, the Germans are able to have complete kind of aerial superiority and so a realistic attempt to interdict shipping is, is, is a very difficult thing to, to realise. They do have some successes. They're able to sink a whole convoy that was there to take part in the German operations to retake Leros. But actually all it does is delay it slightly and the operation does come and, and Leros is lost. Ultimately, the, the losses to sort of the Royal Navy and, and uh, to the Royal Air Force in, in attempts to sort of be involved in the Aegean are huge and the, and the uh, sort of the payoff is very little. They slightly delay a, ret a retaking of Leros, but actually what does, it, what does it translate into? Well, they sort of get kicked out very quickly. They have to evacuate from the Aegean. It's sort of pointed to as the last great British defeat of the Second World War something that, that Churchill in particular in his history of the Second World War is very quick to gloss over. He sort of calls it the end of defeat North Africa, but actually it's still happening. Um, there is a, a concept particularly from Admiral Willis, who's the uh, sort of Commander-in-Chief of the Levant Royal Navy's Commander-in-Chief in the Eastern Mediterranean, that this can be at least used as a basis for opportunity. Well, we've made some inroad into the shipping resources in the Aegean, we can do more now to try and be involved, sort of uh, further attract the attrition in, in uh, the position in the Aegean. Once they have less sort of shipping getting across, we'll have our new Aegean strategy sort of masterminded by Churchill. We'll be able to conduct that effectively. But actually, this kind of all in that he refers to Aegean offensive never materializes. There's just not the American backing for it, and Britain doesn't have the ability to be involved in the Italian campaign and sort of build up for invasion in Northwest Europe and be involved um, in the Aegean as well. So this never quite comes across. And actually, in fact, by mid 1944, the German Admiral Aegean is sort of has to point to yes, we're having serious supply problems. But actually, sort of times were better supplied than people on the mainland, so they're not able to, to make real inroads in the, in the Aegean in general. And the German withdrawal from the Aegean is part of just sort of a wider strategic withdrawal at that stage in, at that stage in the war and isn't really related to the anti-shipping campaign at all. So overall then, vast majority, uh, vast quantities of, of Axis shipping is sunk in the Mediterranean, which is 700 1,700 plus merchant vessels, um, nearly 3 million tonnes, and actually huge quantities of this, very significant quantities of this, are sunk after the fall in North Africa. So clearly the campaign is much longer and much wider than, than this idea of just North Africa. And in North Africa, it is very much uh, important at crucial moments. Operation Crusader, Alam Halfa, Slash al Almine, this is when it's having importance in terms of uh, sort of first of all forcing the Axis to grind to a halt for lack of supplies and then sort of laying the foundation for the British to advance west again after they have uh, sort of a, an enemy that's less able to resist against them because they don't have the supplies. Tunisia clearly effective but it's also uh, important in a wider sense in things like uh, uh, curtailing Axis air forces in Sardinia and protecting their own supply lines so it has this wider effect but it does fail where it's not, they're not able to sort of get involved very effectively. Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, all of these are evacuated very effectively over short uh, sort of sea lines of communication that aren't uh, in positions that are very vulnerable. In the Adriatic, the vast majority of the stuff is sent across effectively and it's delivered. In the Aegean, they don't have the ability to sort of get forces there to operate effectively. They're in a position where they're, they're, it's enemy sort of aerial superiority. They're not able to do this. Um, but the, the attrition of Axis shipping overall also has its own importance, draws sort of vast quantities of materials into this area of where they're having to constantly look to repair ship 
shipping in the shipyards. Shipyards are sort of in Italy uh, from kind of mid 42 onwards are focused purely pretty much on uh, repair of shipping and where they can construction of new shipping and to a lesser extent the ports in, in uh, south sort of ex-Vichy France are also sort of controlled by the Germans are, are really focused on this as well. Uh, large quantities of iron for instance have to be shipped uh, away from sort of other possible uh, areas uh, where they can be used they're needed in, in in sort of other parts of the German war industry but they have to be sent to, to get involved with the uh, sort of uh, sort of rebuilding the logistics situation in the Mediterranean and in fact the uh, a German rice commissar for shipping, a guy called Kaufmann, complains about a, a shipping crisis in the Mediterranean once you get into 1943. So it, it has a wider effect, but it, it's clearly there is some kind of hit and miss for the for the anti-shipping campaign. Really, sort of point to clear effects in North Africa, more sort of wider effects, yes, Sardinia, but 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 less so elsewhere, and they really do overreach themselves in the Aegean, for instance, where it's just beyond their range to to realistically do something. So I'd argue that we need to take a wider view of the campaign uh, and we need to sort of assess its, its merits and its faults more effectively than just this kind of narrow view on, on North Africa only that I think we've got to date. So there we go, that's my paper. Thank you very much. This kind of stuff is just fantastic. I mean, so if anybody needs to slip away, this kind of stuff is fantastic. It, it just allows us to understand the Second World War in a way that we haven't been able to do necessarily up to now. I mean, so by plotting fluctuations in the in flows of uh, logistics, we can interrogate the interrelationship between multiple causes of victory and defeat. And one bit that I think three five, was it crusader. I mean, the air power especially is here. By that it seems in every campaign, certainly in the first half, we will decide with air superiority wins. It seems to be it seems to be a remarkable correlation. And here you're, you're pointing out it's aviation fuel or the lack of aviation fuel that's completely grounding the German Air Force. And it comes through in all the stuff I've looked at, say, censorship summaries in, in Crusader, the fact that all of a sudden the Royal Air Force has superiority in the air. And this has a massive effect on the British troops and correspondingly has a dramatic negative effect on, on uh, German and Italian troops. Yeah. I guess that's more of a point than a question. <laughs> But yeah, no, absolutely. It has. I mean, all of the all of the reports coming through from sort of sort of Panzer Army. When you look at the Italian material as well, everything is saying you know we don't have the necessary air support. It's not coming through, but the the, the air forces are, are clearly pointing. You know, we don't have the fuel to do it. And this idea that it's this idea from Van Krevold in particular. That it's well, the, the material's there. It's just not getting forward. It's not there. It's not there in terms of aviation fuel in, in late forty one. They don't have what they need. Um, and obviously, yeah, the use of air power impacts elsewhere. And so if you article in air power review on the air power and air power morale in North Africa it has a knock-on effect in, in so many sort of different aspects. Yeah, so it's it's all interlinked, and this is one kind of strand of the web, certainly. Yeah, good question, Richard. If most of the shipping is going across the Aegean to to um, uh, you know, to, to Greece to Albania. Things and that was one of the figures you had kind of early on. Um, to what ends, and, and what can we say from that about the significance of North Africa, and or at least sort of how it was perceived by the Italians, the Germans, etc. Um, well, I mean, Sagovich has, has come out with this idea. James Sagovich come, comes out with this idea that actually the biggest priority for the Italians is across the Adriatic. It's, it's Greece. That's where the biggest priority is for them. And he points to this, you know, vast quantities of material going across as his, his main reason for that. Well, OK, it's a huge draw on material. I want to sort of draw out that there's a much wider logistics network. But really, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the focus for the Italians is, is kind of shifts over the course of the war in general. Um, obviously, sort of Mussolini talks about a sort of building his Mediterranean empire. Um, but... It, in, in terms of their sort of focus, it's still North Africa that's, that's taking the priority for them. I mean, one of the reasons why there's, there's so much more sent across is, well, yeah, the Greek theatre is a huge draw on, on material. They have to send vast quantities of, of stuff across to keep it supplied. Uh, but also, um, 
it's, it's a much shorter route, so you can have a much quicker sort of turnaround in that sense. Whereas it's much harder across the across the sort of med in, in general on the on the kind of north to south route. So really, I mean the the. The focus is, is North Africa while North Africa exists for both the Italians and the Germans. If you look at the um, the Italian chief of staff's meetings, have all been have all been published in Italian, but they've been published. Uh, they all focus on on North Africa nearly all the time. There's, there's comparatively little talk about about what's going on in the Aegean or about what's going on in the um, in Greece. Really, the focus for them is still North Africa. Uh, but they, they appreciate the need that they have to keep everything supplied and therefore there's, there's concerns in, in terms of having the shipping able to do it, the ability to sort of keep your Mediterranean position in place. What percentage, um, what percentage loss really is catastrophic for an army in a campaign in North Africa? Because Martin Kitchen has given good, um, percentages of, of losses as well and I think he I don't know if they're higher than what you've given, but certainly the impression you get from reading his book is that it's utterly, dramatically, and completely catastrophic for, for the Axis forces in September, October, November. But what, I mean, so, you know, 11% lost in July in terms of fuel, 41% in August, 23% in September, 42. I mean, you, you assume that some of you lost. So what, what is the, where does the, I know it might be difficult to find an arbitrary point, but what is actually catastrophic? What actually really does stop armies moving? Well, in, term, in terms of their, uh, like, the, the, there's numerous different sets of figures for what the requirement is. Yeah. They, they, it depends on who you listen to, and in particular, I mean, obviously, there's, there's the Rommel papers, which are, are written after the event, yeah. so, you know, they're very much sort of Rommel trying to sort of point blame at everyone except himself. Um, but whether you look from Rommel's actual signals from the time, or whether you're looking at someone like Kesselring, uh, you look at the sort of the Italian figures as well. They do vary. There's there's various. That's why we've had sort of different sets of figures across the historiography in, in general at times. Um, but I mean, it's not necessarily about the sort of the, uh, the percentage that sunk uh, so much. Sometimes as where that percentage is going. So if it's going sort of um, further east, then sort of smaller quantities of sinking can have greater effect mm -hmm. because it's not then partly eaten up on the route across the overland route anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, in terms of in terms of what's devastating, well, you know, ninety-two percent loss of fuel in in November mm -hmm. uh, in November nineteen forty-one. It's, it's not possible yes. to deal with that at all, and that's you know, it, it's simply sort of not there. There's nothing there to be able to to work with. But then only five percent in December. Only 5% of December, which is well, this idea that it, it's very important in November and into early December, because there's a few sinkings crucially in early December. The reason why it's only 5% in December is uh, late in December, the Italian Navy makes this all-out effort, sort of what they call the battleship convoys, where they basically send their whole fleet to escort a, a couple of convoys over in December and, and January, which takes the, the total sort of greatly upwards uh, in that sense. And it is interesting that they bounce back. Yeah, well, there's, some, there's a whole bounce back in, in early 42 in general. If you look at the Mediterranean, what's happening in, in early 1942. Well, Crusader grinds to a halt for all sorts of reasons, but then actually uh, the, the Axis Air Force is coming back sort of with a vengeance over, over Malta and um, sort of it's, it's a turn back across the, the field. They're put back on the defensive. You know, the Italians are able to to sort of sink these two two battleships in Alexandria Harbour and Cunningham's talking about not having a fleet to go to sea in all of a sudden and it does seem like they're, they're on the back foot in, in every aspect in, in 1942. So it's, it, it's part of that bigger whole sort of wider picture in that sense anyway. I think that's illustrative as well potentially the, in looking at figures because it's one of the great things that gets abused in doctrine tends to be the, the Churchill quote in the back air having the most difficult of all military things to quantify. And it's always as though it's thrown into doctrine now with that it's all without referencing um, it must be added as well, almost as an excuse to go to the, without there ever being the analysis to demonstrate that this throwaway line by Churchill is true. But of course part of it is and you know, Tim Tim I'm sure will have a view on this as well, part of it as well is the fact that a lot of the air power that you have to quantify in a number of circumstances is about actually air maritime operation, land-based air, where you'll see them there, land-based air collaborating with surface units, 
submarines and organic air where available doing this. So actually trying to quantify it, basically we talk about air power, you actually have to end up talking about air power as a whole, which of course then isn't particularly useful in supporting parochial arguments only where you divide the budget. So I think that's sort of, it, 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 I mean, I don't know whether Tim and Christine have a view on this, but it always strikes me that you, you actually sort of give a very clear vision here of the fact that when it comes to quantifying what air power does, if it actually takes quite a lot of time to do this, it's actually detailed analysis of the sort that you've conducted that actually switches the light bulb on. You can say, ah, yes, this is what it does, but you also, of course, have to say, in conjunction with, and it's a long-running theme throughout the quantification of air, is the sort of the, the true believers wishing to not talk about the role of the other two services, uh, particularly if they've got aeroplanes of their own. Um, that creates many problems, and you then end up with sort of the, let's just deploy a, ch a few Churchillian quotes. So sort of go, always be difficult. Um, and it's always along the lines. It's almost along the lines. Well, you wouldn't understand it. Again, we talk about kittens out of the Harry Enfield sketch. Um, <laughs> I sometimes feel, but I'm not entirely sure how I was going to tweet that. Um, but you end up as a you know you end up with this difficulty that only diligent historical research of the sort you presented today actually starts to cast light on this. Doesn't it really do what Bob wants us to do, which is, oh wow, everybody wants us to do it, which is to actually increase impact. I mean, we were talking about, what's the impact of your research yesterday? Um, I think if the figure you present in your journal of strategic studies article is 41% of all the shipping going across was sunk by aircraft. Is that, so that's, that's a quite a serious percentage. So how do we connect with our military colleagues here and get them to see here's here, here's air power we can measure the impact here and, and what Richard had to yeah. do was much more difficult in the Mediterranean setting compared with for example Northwest Europe because the stats a lot of that had been digested already but you had to piece it together um, really the, the much more difficult way and that, that that's the big um, selling point of your work because you're able to establish the proportions and because to be frank people were afraid of the statistical analysis people say oh no that's a bit too difficult compared with northwest european comparisons you know what, what made the greatest impact i think so i think going back to jonathan's point as well actually if you look at neil's presentation there's a very you know, a very discreet example of an effect that can be achieved which people just look at the raw statistics without taking the, the broader view, as you've done with this. Um, I think so Neil, Neil hinted at this, and uh, he and I have chatted about this because I'm years and years ago started writing an article about 151 score, which I never actually finished. Um, but uh, as is my point. Um, but you end up with a circumstance where actually you look at various discrete things and have to piece them together in the broad picture, and that you know, there is the impact. If you want to quantify what air does, but again, I think it does come back slightly to this as well, the fear of actually if we say that this had an impact, it kind of undermines this argument in budgetary <coughs> terms, et cetera, et cetera. I'm maybe getting cynical of my own. Well, we have to have evidence-based. But you want to have evidence-based, yeah. Um, and a lot of this stuff is not evidence-based. And not from the air power, you know, from, from all, all yeah. both pro and anti camps, a lot of it is plucked out of the air. Um, one of the best things you've done was to completely undermine Van Creffel. Yeah, because the guys are idiot. Can you I say something you, that you're, sorry, you've had the process, your archival experience, where you got these sources? Because I think when you've got the stories here, if you can just answer what you were saying. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a huge sort of quantity of material out there, and, and I think one of the reasons why there's been so many different perspectives on this anyway, there's, there's so many different sets of figures uh, that are available, but a, a lot of the time I think people don't actually use uh, the Italian material enough. So I mean, it's ultimately the views from the sort of of the Axis side are always informed by the German material all the time. Particularly Van Krebel, he, he points to a couple of uh, of Italian secondary sources, but he, he doesn't actually use the Italian official histories that have this massive kind of statistical breakdown of everything that's sent across. Um, he, he's, he very much uses the German sort of side of the sources, but actually it's the Italians that are running the running it logistically. It's them that are involved with sort of um, getting the shipping together, putting it across uh, the Italian Navy in terms of in terms of organising it, in terms of putting it together and escorting it. 
is that it, it's them that do it. So there's a lot of great stuff in the Italian official histories, but also there's a lot of a lot of the material that hasn't been kind of analysed as well is, is things like the uh, papers of the uh, Reich Commissar for Shipping, which are at, at Duxford. Um, they have a sort of a great kind of breakdown of, of you know problems on on the t in terms of, of, of shipping that's available. So Van Crevel sort of you know takes the stats without going into them in the sense of well you know this much shipping has been sunk, but actually they seize all this other shipping from elsewhere. So really, actually the overall attrition is is uh, you know much smaller than people expect. They manage to replace over half their losses, but actually if you look at what they get, what they seize. A lot of it's not actually ready to operate, needs to then spend a long time in port being sort of refitted, uh, or it's not actually fit for purpose in the first place. So yeah, okay, they've they've kind of put the the headline figure back up, but actually, if you look at it, it's it's not kind of things that can be used a lot of the time anyway. So actually, what they've recovered is is a lot less than if you just sort of take the the headline figure. So uh, yeah, I'd say across across what's available from kind of the uh, Intelligence intercepts, which in the DEFI files, or um, a Q, or whether it's uh, the Rice Commissar's papers at, at Duxford, or whether it's the Italian official history, you have to piece it together from a lot of different places and, and kind of compare and contrast it, which is difficult a lot of the time, but it needs to be done. It hasn't been done before, and that's why we're kind of getting these slightly sort of bipolar arguments in, in the historiography that exist to date a lot of the time. It's part of the group that the Second World War historians catch up on all the 30 years of the First World War or something. <laughs> Listen, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, super. And really, really enjoyed it.